Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, delighted uh, to have you here. Uh, this this is this is going to be fun tonight. And of course, we've got uh, we've got two really superb teams and two remarkable schools, and it's going to be a battle of the titans. And I'm excited to hear this. It's a it's a topic that I personally. Um, I personally care a great deal about, and I'm, I'm probably, I'm, I'm probably not objective on it. Okay, so that's the first thing I should say. But let me try to stay as objective as I can, just for a few minutes, to frame the importance of this. Uh, you know, it, the foundation of, the foundation of America's 60-year uh, history on this question goes back to the very famous Adams for Peace speech um, that President Eisenhower formulated. And uh, I think it was probably one of the most salient and important uh, policy uh, frameworks that's ever been developed in the last 60 years. It was one that we had to think through. You know, many of the other policy frameworks that we had over the last 60 years were forced on us. We had to figure it out. We had really serious problems, and we just had to figure it out. And we usually stumbled our way until we got to a defendable posture. But this was one we actually had to conceptualize. And it was, it, it took a number of years, really, to get to it. Um, and we had to think through what was going to be this uh, framework that would harness the potential of nuclear energy as, a, as an abundant commercial source of electricity <laughs> and reconcile it uh, against all of the risks that come with nuclear proliferation. You know, the, er, er, every weapons program essentially springs from a from the foundation that's of commercial nuclear energy. You know, e every one, because it's all about enriching nuclear material. In the natural world, uranium doesn't appear in any quantity that you could use it. So you have to concentrate it. So you concentrate it from one thousandth of one percent in ore stock to get it up to about four percent. But that represents about 85 percent of the work it takes to get to a weapon. Because to go from 4% to 90% is only the last 15% of the job. You know? And that's been, the, that's been the inherent dilemma of this. We knew that, that there was such enormous promise, and there still is enormous promise, in commercial nuclear energy. Let me just give you a sense of scale on this. Um, a 1,000 megawatt plant of uh, nuclear power, if you are going to fuel that with fuel oil, we don't do it that way anymore, but if you were to try to generate a thousand megawatts with fuel oil, you know those great big tanker trucks that drive up, you know, to the gas station at night and, you know, fill up the gas station? One plant would empty one of those trucks every seven minutes. That gives you a sense of scale of nuclear power. It's an enormous source of base power generation, an enormous sense. There's nothing quite like it. But it does have also this inherent risk, the security risk. So when Adams for Peace was formulated, it was trying to find a framework that put this in balance. And ironically, it isn't well understood, but the commercial nuclear side of nuclear power is the essential ingredient of transparency to try to prevent proliferation. Because we ask countries to sign up to the NPT treaty, and I will tell you, 90% of everything we know that's going on in Iran is because they signed up to the NPT treaty, because they had the right to develop commercial nuclear energy. So it's a very complicated landscape. Commercial nuclear energy cannot be separated from the future of proliferation prevention. See, this central, complex uh, problem, which got embedded together in the uh, Atoms for Peace, is still with us. 
60 years later. And we're still debating it. And it's an important debate. The most important thing about the debate is that all of us honestly go through the details. I don't have any idea where, which side you guys are on tonight. And I know in, when it comes to debating, you flip sides, you know? I mean, and that's good too. Huh? It is having the debate. It's having that foundation of knowledge about what we're facing, what, what we're facing as a country, as a world. That's why I think this topic is so important, uh, very important. And it is not understood in Washington. So I'm grateful that you guys are coming to Washington. It's a bit of a missionary project here. You're going to bring all of this back alive, and you're going to help us rethink this whole complex landscape. Thank you for doing that. And I want to welcome and thank all of you for coming today. Let's turn this over to you guys. I don't know who's going to really run this. What Are you running this, Karen? All right, get up here. I've had my say. Terrific. Thank you, Dr. Hamry. Um, it's great to see a room full of people for this event. Uh, my name is Karen Meacham. I'm the Director of Educational Outreach here and the uh, <clears throat> Dean of our Leadership Academy. And uh, again, very excited to host you all for this exciting evening. One thing I wanted to say is, you know, the currency of ideas here in Washington, or the currency of Washington is ideas. That's what I meant to say. The currency of Washington is ideas, and CSIS is definitely in this ideas business, right? Uh, and a major part of my work here is to run our leadership academy, and a big part of the leadership academy is our fabulous debate clinic, uh, which really looks at these fundamentals of argument and advocacy and developing these ideas and knowledge. Is, Dr. Hamry alluded to. Um, and I have to pause just for a moment to recognize a couple of people in the audience who have been uh, leaders in our debate clinic. Uh, er Eli Jacobs, who this whole event tonight was his idea. Eli, please raise your hand. Quit looking back. <laughs> Eli Jacobs, Sarah, uh, Sarah Weiner, raise your hand. She runs a lot of our debate clinics for our interns. Uh, Seth Gannon's in the audience, John Warden. Matt Fisher, I saw Stephanie Spees. Uh, again, these are people on staff at CSIS. They are research assistants. They work very hard on whether they're in the nuclear program or global health or other programs, and they do this on the side. So again, they're dedicated to this concept of debate, developing ideas, argument, advocacy. <clears throat> so I'm excited to present uh, an event tonight featuring some of the finest debaters in the country. And in, just to give you an idea, and many uh, of you in the audience are also debaters or former debaters, but in a regular season of a typical year in college debate, there are seven major national tournaments. And each of these tournaments draws a majority of the best teams uh, from around the country. So in the 2012-2013 academic year, uh, these two teams from Georgetown and Northwestern collectively won six out of the seven national tournaments. So you could say they're pretty good, pretty good at this. Um, so, not only uh, are they talented debaters, but they've been spending the past year debating about U.S. energy policy, okay? So thousands of hours really researching nuclear energy and all of its uh, nuances and capacity. Um, here tonight, so to put good knowledge to, knowledge to good use, we're advancing, they're actually here advancing the national debate about the future of nuclear power in the United States. So. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time introducing these debaters individually. I also want to recognize our panel of expert judges. They're issue experts. I want to read their bios briefly uh, and then give you a little bit of the layout for the evening. Eli Jacobs, who again I said was the, the brainchild behind this entire event, is going to come up and, and help with the uh, really running the debate because he's, he's a pro. But so from Georgetown, which will represent the affirmative in this debate, is Andrew Markoff and Andrew Arsht. So in reverse order, uh, Andrew Arst is a theology major. Andrew Markoff is an international history major. Uh, they're both juniors. And if you're curious, uh, they were actually ranked number one uh, this, this past year nationally. From Northwestern, which will represent the negative, uh, is close at their heels, uh, 
in national championships, we have Peyton Lee and Arjun Velayapan. Excuse me, Velayapan. Uh, Peyton Lee is our lone senior over there. She's a math and political science major and will be going to law school at Harvard next year. So she's a shabby, uh, you know, slacker, I can tell. And um, Arjun is a sophomore studying economics. And, and again, they were also at the top of the field in, in these national competitions. We are uh, looking over the podium, incredibly lucky to have uh, three issue experts as judges. We have our own in-house David Banks, who is new here, but he comes with a, a terrific background. He's a senior fellow, deputy director of the nuclear energy program here at CSIS, where he focuses on the link between the health of the U.S. civil nuclear sector and U.S. national security interests, including capabilities of the nuclear-powered U.S. Navy and U.S. influence to shape global proliferation and safety standards. So again, he has a distinguished background in the private sector. He spent several years in the Senate and also in the Bush administration as senior advisor on international affairs and climate change to the chairman of the White House Council on Environmental Quality. So again, executive experience, legislative experience. So sitting next to David, uh, thank you, David, for joining us. We have Scott Siegel who is head of the Policy Resolution Group and founder of the Strategic Communications Practice at Bracewell and Giuliani. Uh, he's over two decades of experience across a broad range of policy and communication issues, specifically dealing with energy, the environment, natural resources. Uh, my understanding is that Scott was also a debater. Is that fair? So uh, hey, there you go. Um, really appreciate you being here. Last but not least, Thomas Lawler, uh, who is a principal at Lawler Strategies, where he works with um, a variety of groups, corporations and advocacy groups, um, to really work with them on their federal policy goals. And previously, he spent some time in the Senate. He served as chief policy advisor on energy and environmental issues for Senator Carper from Delaware and manage the Subcommittee on Clean Air and Nuclear Safety for the Environment and Public Works Committee. So again, our three judges, uh, where we have definitely uh, issuary experts here with the debaters, uh, but really people that have had a career of these issues uh, judging, so much appreciated. Uh, last but not least, I do want to thank um, our sponsors who, uh, Bracewell and Giuliani, Southern, and I'm gonna get this wrong, the nuclear, help me, Nuclear Energy Institute, who graciously provided the sushi and lovely beverages and everything else in the back. So please thank you. Please join me in thanking our sponsors. Okay, so let's get to the meat of the program. I'm going to, uh, again, welcome, thank you, I pass it over to Eli, who is going to uh, help us with the formalities. Thanks again. All right, so thank you all for coming. I'll be brief. Uh, just three notes. First. The resolution tonight, the topic, is that the United States should revitalize its nuclear power industry. And the team from Georgetown, which is to my far right, will be affirmative, so they'll say that's a good idea. The team from Northwestern to my closer right will be negative, and they'll say it's a bad idea. Um, second note is about format. You all were distributed an agenda at the door, so I won't go into too much detail. Um, but basically, each of the debaters here will give a five-minute speech, followed by three minutes of questions from the other team. After that sort of initial set of four units of speech, um, there'll be some questions from our expert panel of judges, after which we'll turn it over to the audience for audience questions. Um, and then each debate team, each team will give a five minute concluding rebuttal, and then we'll turn it back over to our judges for 15 minutes of concluding comments and remarks. Um, the last note is that you should meet, be sure that you use microphones at all times. So is true for debaters and judges. There's a little button at the bottom there, so just turn it on, and that's so that our online audience um, and posterity will be able to see and hear the event. All right, so thanks again for coming, and I'll turn it over to, I guess, Andrew Markoff to get us started. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. Before I start, I just want to give a couple very quick thank yous uh, to the CSIS uh, for their incredible hospitality having us here today. Uh, obviously, our three judges, Mr. Banks, Mr. Siegel, Mr. Lawler, for taking the time out of their schedule to come watch and give us comments. Uh, to the audience, everyone who showed up, it's great to have a, a large crowd here. 
um, and hopefully you'll enjoy to Dr. Hamry and Ms. Meacham for introducing the debate and for Eli Jacobs, of course, for setting this all up, um, as well as all the sponsors for providing necessary funding. So without further ado, let's get underway. In this debate, me and my partner, Andrew Arsh, will argue that the DOD should take a first mover role and purchase small modular reactors for its domestic bases in the United States. A small modular reactor, or SMR, is a nuclear reactor which produces less than 300 megawatts of electricity. Now, reactors now, a large light water reactor, usually produces between maybe 1,000 to 1,200 megawatts. So we're talking about a three to four fold reduction in output with a corresponding decrease in size, water consumption, fuel, etc. Now, as some of you may have heard, the Department of Energy recently gave out $500 million in loans to develop SMRs in Georgia. But the existing package is going to prove vastly insufficient to create a new nuclear industry in the United States for two reasons. First, the cost of achieving approval from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for a commercial SMR is estimated to be about $2 billion. The existing loan package is not nearly enough to create an SMR hooked up to the grid, even if it creates a demonstration. Second, is that the DOE as an institution lacks the market pull and the experience commercializing new technologies in order to get an industry off the ground. The DOD, however, can solve these shortfalls. Jeffrey Marcuse, who's the executive director of the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program at DOD, explains in 2012, reasons for past failures at DOE are lack of a market within DOE, a disconnect between business practices at DOE, and commercial practices, since DOE is neither the ultimate supplier nor the ultimate buyer of these technologies, there are challenges in creating a system that can bring technologies across the valley of death. DOD's market size, however, allows it to play a critical role that can overcome these challenges. So why pursue SMRs? We think there are many reasons, but we'll be brief and isolate two. First is non-proliferation. SMRs create a strong nuclear export market that will strengthen the domestic nuclear industrial base, which is critical to US leverage over the international fuel cycle. CSIS's very own Michael Wallace and Sarah Williams write in 2012, America's nuclear energy industry is in decline. China, India, Russia, and other countries are looking to significantly expand their nuclear commitments. 15 new nations could have this tech within the next two decades. America's ability to exert leadership is directly linked to the strength of our domestic industry. In the past, the US provided a model for industry self-regulation. The results were not perfect, but America's institutional support for global non-proliferation helped shape the way nuclear tech was adopted and used. This influence seems to be certain to wane if the US is no longer a major supplier or user of nuclear tech. Second, SMRs will insulate DOD bases from grid vulnerability, which is a growing risk to effective operations and command infrastructure in the United States. George Robitaille, who is a civilian working on the Army's strategy research report, wrote in 2012, the Department of Defense depends on electricity at military facilities, which are controlled by a public grid, which is susceptible to age of infrastructure, natural disasters, and cyber attacks. The DOD, in fact, gets 99% of their electrical requirements from the public grid. Components, however, are over 100 years old. Admiral Blair, the former director of national intelligence, testified before Congress that uh, the growing connectivity of our grid creates opportunities for attackers. SMRs, however, are able to provide a secure and independent source of electricity in the event that the public grid is compromised. Now, one concern raised by critics of SMRs is cost. Can they compete? We think they can. Ionis Kessides and Vladimir Kutsasov from the World Bank explained in 2012, SMRs overcome key barriers that have inhibited the growth of nuclear power. They have smaller size, lower power, and simpler design, which allow for greater modularization of units, standardization, and fabrication. SMRs can benefit from the economies of multiples that accrue to mass production of components in a factory. Building reactors in a series instead of individually can lead to significant per unit cost reductions. 
Another concern is safety, and we think there are two important things to note. First, the sum total of life-threatening injuries or deaths that have resulted from commercial nuclear accidents in the United States is zero, ever, which is far less than casualties from industrial accidents associated with any other energy source. Second, SMRs incorporate new passive safety features which prevent accidents. Robert Rosner, a professor of astrophysics at the University of Chicago and the former director of the Argonne National Laboratory explains in 2011 that SMR designs incorporate passive safety features that utilize gravity driven or natural convection systems. SMRs have a much lower level of heat decay and require less cooling after reactor shutdown. Designs eliminate the need for backup. They improve seismic capability. They provide large and robust underground pool storage for waste. These designs present a strong safety case for SMRs. Thank you. So you mentioned NRC hurdles as a key barrier to the current DOE SMR development. What does a DOD first mover role do to avoid that concern? Uh, I mean, I guess I would say two things. First is that the NRC has to license small modular reactors no matter what. Now that process isn't much different from licensing existing light water reactors. And we believe since that they're safer, smaller, easier to construct, that that's a relatively painless process. But second, the DOD, as a multiple decade user of nuclear fuel for nuclear submarines, for example, has a working relationship with the NRC that's far stronger than the DOE does. That's fair. Um, how long do you believe, or does the Wallace and Williams expert evidence discuss for developing a robust domestic commercial nuclear base in order to gain international leverage? Yeah, that's a great question, Arjun. Uh, a few things. The designs for SMRs have already been drawn up. So we know how to build them. We know what they look like. We largely know how they'll work. There have been demonstrations before the Navy has built them, as I alluded to earlier. Uh, obviously, it's not a quick process, though. You know, you need to get SMR factories up and running. You need to get the DOD to first purchase technology, then disseminate it to the private sector. We would say, you know, maybe a decade, maybe two. But there's an important signal that we think even just the initial act of revitalizing nuclear would have for people who might be concerned about proliferation risks that I think we should also be aware of. Sure. And then in the context of that, you talk about kind of the small scale civilian efforts that are happening. Sure. Why aren't those the sufficient signal or starting point for SMRs that sure. your evidence discusses? Well, I think, you know, we outlined that in the beginning. Um, the DOE allocated about 500 million to the Savannah River test site in Georgia for small modular reactors. And that is definitely sufficient or maybe sufficient to create a demonstration project. So we'll build an SMR, it will run, it will work, uh, but is it enough to overcome the licensing hurdles to construct multiple? We don't think so. And the piece of evidence we read from the Marcuse study uh, says that the DOD has unique connections with industry. So if the DOE acts as a test bed, they're like, we'll build this SMR, the industry thinks the DOE is incredible, they think the DOE won't purchase from them if they decide to create their own SMR units. And the DOD, by contrast, regularly purchases from the private sector. And it regularly engages with those private sector contractors. Uh, so there's a more credible signal of commitment from the DOD than the DOE. Last question. Uh, you talk about grid vulnerabilities. If it truly has been so vulnerable and in urgent need of repair since the 2008 Defense Science Board report that your evidence cites, how can you account for the absence of an effective attack or total shutdown? Uh, I think so part of the piece of evidence by Robitaille in that study talks about how there have been probes onto the US grid by hackers, uh, perhaps from China, Russia, or non-state actors. So the risk is sort of increasing. Plus, we know from O3 how vulnerable the grid is. And sorry, I won't go any more over yeah. time. Okay. Thank you. Arjun and I would also like to say thank you for everyone who's shown up today. Um, we appreciate you taking your time out of your busy schedules. To Dr. Hamry and Ms. Meacham for the kind introductions, CSIS and especially Eli for putting this all together, the judges for donating their time and correcting whatever we say at the end. Um, so in response, we believe the Department of Defense should not pursue a first mover role 
in the development of SMRs for a number of reasons. First and foremost is that small modular reactors, especially in the context of a first mover role, are extraordinarily expensive. No matter what benefits that they provide, those must be weighed against the inevitable costs associated with their development and their procurement. According to Marcus King, an associate research professor of international affairs at George Washington University, the first of a kind expense of developing small nuclear power plants would be in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Thomas Cochran, a member of the Department of Energy's Nuclear Energy Advisory Committee, states that even once developed, the materials cost per kilowatt of a reactor goes up as the size goes down. The reactor surface area, which dominates material costs, goes up. Secondary containment, independent systems for control, instrumentation, and emergency management all increase as size decreases, since each modularized unit requires its own, its own system. This means that both during the initial development and the later stages of use, SMRs might be even more expensive than current light water reactors. In the current state of sequestration cuts, forced budgetary trade-offs, and extreme demands on the military, the addition of an unnecessary and extremely expensive investment in new SMR technology is unmerited and dangerous. The second serious drawback to SMR procurement for the military is the potential waste and safety issues presented by SMRs. There is currently no federal repository for nuclear waste disposal, and while SMRs could be designed to minimize such byproducts, Nick Cunningham, a policy analyst for energy and climate at the American Security Project, supports that a large expansion of domestic SMR use will still run into the issue of disposal with no current solution. The safety drawbacks of SMRs also present a troubling issue. In particular, the presence of nuclear reactors on military bases massively amplifies the consequences of any meltdown. Daniel Nexon, an associate professor in the School of Foreign Service and the Department of Government at Georgetown University, points out that the presence of an SMR on a base makes an extremely attractive target for attack. While mitigated risks of meltdowns are extremely promising, the potential for an unpredictable collapse still presents an extreme danger when located so close to critical facilities. In particular, the NRC has no current licensing pathway for SMRs, which presents a major hurdle to safe and widespread development. With regards to the benefits that Georgetown has isolated, let us first say that in the status quo, there are major efforts being made to develop SMRs in conjunction with the DOE and the DOD. While the DOD might have market pull for widespread adoption of SMRs, the reactors themselves are still in a stage of technology development that is most effectively nurtured by the funding provided by the DOE. John E. Kelly, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Nuclear Reactor Technologies in the DOE's Office of Nuclear Energy, testified before the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources and stated that the current programs will allow cost-sharing components that will bring in a couple of years what the industry would be able to do with private investments. However, what is slowing the development is the regulatory process, which is a four to six year effort that allows them to have confidence in the safety and security of those units. In particular, this is the approach that the DOD itself has recommended. According to Marcus King, Congress directed the DOD to assess the use of nuclear on military installations in a National Defense Authorization Act of 2010. And because of questions about economic feasibility as a first mover and the risks of being an early adopter of the technology, the DOD preferred not to undertake the project and instead supported the current framework for DOE and DOD partnership and risk sharing, cemented in a memorandum of understanding in 2010. With regards to nonproliferation, this is not a unique reason to pursue DOD SMR development. Obviously, commercial expansion of nuclear captures many of the advantages of proliferation leadership. We find it implausible that states choosing to pursue dangerous proliferation technologies will be influenced or dissuaded by the efforts of the United States to develop a more improved nuclear device. Georgetown has stated that 15 other countries are all expanding their investment in nuclear energy now and provide clear alternatives to nations who do not wish to be influenced by the United States norms of non-proliferation and technology. The long time scale for developing and deploying SMRs domestically and the improbable link between the development of SMRs and non-proliferation objectives means this hardly appears to be a sufficient reason for the massive investment. With regards to grid vulnerability, status quo efforts have resolved these issues. Their evidence is all in the context of a 2008 report that identified the civilian grid as a critical vulnerability. According to Michael Amoni from the Office of the Deputy of Undersecretary of Defense, 
The DoD has since taken action, including a massive increase in backup generation capability linked to critical assets to ensure that power could last through an extended outage. Advanced microgrids are a cost-effective approach being utilized to ensure islanding from civilian grids and steady supply under all circumstances. For all of the reasons outlined above, we believe the DoD should not pursue a first mover role on small modular reactors. Thank you. Okay, Peyton, so the first thing I want to chat about is um, this, you cite Professor Nexon, who, you know, as, as Georgetown students, we're big fans of, but the, his claim here seems a little outlandish. Uh, the presence of an SMR on a base makes an extreme, makes an extremely attractive target for attack. How exactly does someone go about attacking a U.S. military base? Well, our evidence is that that risk, right, the potential either for meltdown or for intentional attack, I personally do not make those plans, but I imagine right. is one that would sort of be incentivized by the presence of something that would massively okay. melt down, especially if you're right about you, sort of base vulnerability. You say that uh, in the status quo, the DOD is already pursuing a policy to create advanced microgrids. What yes. are those? So microgrids are systems that use backup, backup power systems they can use things like diesel, renewables, et cetera, and it's a way to monitor the interactions between those. It's a version of smart grids. Okay. To mo but just, sorry, just yeah, to just be clear. To sorry. Um, just, okay. to, just to be clear, though, they rely on diesel and renewable generation. And the status quo, I think they rely on conventional sources, right? They are not explicitly for nuclear right now for all the reasons we think. So coal plans or natural idea. gas or? Or renewables or diesel, right? Okay. Um, you made an argument about materials cost to say that the cost of SMRs is extremely high. Uh, so we made an argument that as you continue to build out SMRs, you can build them in a factory and mass produce components. Why does it matter how much like the concrete costs? Yeah, so I agree that long term you can make it cost less to produce them when you sort of manufacture them. But that's a relative cost comparison. Yes, that costs less than the first few that you build, which is also probably reason the DoD shouldn't fund the first few. But that's still a huge amount of cost because the basic materials component, which our evidence says is a major part of nuclear costs, those still increase because you're modularizing them. So instead of one big case, you have multiple little cases for the same amount of power. That makes sense. Um, you made Thanks. an allusion to a DoD, DOE memoranda of understanding. What does that lay out? In 2010, it's their cooperation on energy questions. So it was explicitly they were tasked with evaluating whether or not we should pursue nuclear on bases, right, what you think mm -hmm. we should do. And the DOD said that because of first mover costs and because of the risks of being a new adopter of a technology that's yet unproven, that instead the DOE should pursue the research and investment that they're currently doing to develop those technologies before the DOD starts using them. So the DOD is currently not committed to purchasing an SMR. Uh, I don't believe so. Otherwise, I think your AF is done, right? right? That makes total sense. Um, the last sort of question is about waste. You make an argument that when we build out more SMRs, there will be more waste. And I guess, you know, right now we store waste on site, which seems to be, at least in the medium term, somewhat sustainable. Yeah, there no. are certainly regulatory concerns about whether or not that is an effective solution, but your advocacy is for a massive expansion of the amount of nuclear that we use to power every military base in the United States and spill over commercially, which would be a lot Thank more. you. Uh, Okie doke. Um, before I begin, I'd like to echo, <coughs> excuse me, the, the thank yous said earlier, but for the sake of time, I'll, you know, not repeat what Markov said so eloquently. Uh, so, here we go. I'll, uh, I'll start by addressing the non-proliferation argument that was in our first speech, since the negative seems to misunderstand the argument. SMRs might not stop states that have already made the decision to nuclearize. That, that's not our point. SMRs accomplish two ancillary goals that contribute to reducing the risk of breakout capabilities before they ever arise. First, a strong domestic nuclear industrial base allows the US to offer states seeking civilian nuclear power a viable alternative to domestic enrichment and reprocessing capabilities, what Dr. Hamry referenced in his introduction. An SMR falls within almost every government's economic capabilities and is uniquely suited to older, smaller power grids. If a country decided to pursue domestic enrichment and reprocessing, in spite of the offer of an SMR, the international community could flag such an incident and take subsequent precautionary action. 
Right now, there is no way to accomplish this objective because the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty specifically protects states' rights to enrichment and reprocessing for peaceful purposes. We think SMRs are unique because they largely bypass this concern because they're a self-contained unit. Specifically, US commercial leadership furthers our ability to influence the norms that pervade the international discussion that occurs over nuclear weapons. The pretension that Russia, India, and China will just fill in and pursue the same norms as the US is an exercise, we think, in historical ignorance. Now for grid vulnerability. Microgrids are a good start, but they're not being implemented as widely as the Defense Department has advertised. Daniel Sater, a research fellow at Global Green USA, writes in 2011, in the first six months of 2011, the grid suffered 155 blackouts. Bases rely solely on the grid to power 99% of warfighting capabilities. DOD rarely invests in microgrids. DOD's net zero initiative does little to increase energy assurance at military installations. Additionally, as established by my partner in cross-examination, microgrids rely on inputs that are themselves subject to intermittency and entirely unproven. If the choice is between a whole new grid and SMRs, it seems like their arguments about escalating operation and maintenance costs are largely irrelevant. Now for Northwestern's core concerns. It's true that SMRs are expensive, but the military purchases its electricity from the civilian market now, which puts tremendous pressure on budgets. This is especially true overseas, where oil is often the only available fuel. Their Cochrane evidence relies on a slate of hand that equates square footage of concrete with total costs. The massive expense involved in constructing a new containment facility for each large reactor is resolved, as explained, via fab factory fabrication. Since there's only one self-contained standard model, even safety overhead should be subject to those same diminishing returns of scale. The waste concern is, frankly, old news and applies to all nuclear power, not just SMRs. Perhaps a new SMR industry would lift the political sclerosis that surrounds the waste issue now. Perhaps eventually SMRs will use generation four designs that consume old waste to produce power. Regardless, there's a ton of it sitting in dry casks at every nuclear facility in the country, and they have not presented why a permanent geological storage facility is preferable, necessary, or even in the offing. This isn't our problem, it's theirs, because we move in the right direction. DOD knows the risks of putting SMRs in a combat theater and would not do so for the very reasons listed in their Nexon evidence. Like many of the negatives concerns, we think it's a problem that resolves itself via simple precautions on the part of agency officials. As far as an attack on a domestic base is concerned, I'd say there are easier ways for interested parties to acquire nuclear material, and there's never been a successful attack on a domestic conventional reactor which have less security than a military base. What about accidents? The argument that the military lacks experience operating and handling nuclear reactors is patently false. The Navy has accrued thousands of reactor years of operating life without a single accident. But the Army has also successfully operated an SMR-style reactor in the 1970s. Brigadier General, uh, retired, Jerry Galloway, a professor of engineering and public policy at the University of Maryland remarks, small nuclear reactors aboard the Sturgis provided power to the Panama Canal for nearly 10 years. We can't be entirely sure how the licensing process will eventually play out because no one has submitted an application for a design yet, but there are no substantive differences between the current process for approval and one that would be acceptable for an SMR. William Media, who was the laboratory director at Oak Ridge National Laboratory writes, since SMRs are based on proven and licensed components and are passively safe, we should not expect licensing issues. Finally, the status quo provides a simple test case for whether the 2010 memorandum of understanding that they're referencing was a success. Has there been a single SMR built since then? No. Look, we all seem to agree that DOD possesses a unique ability to commercialize nascent technologies via its testbed programs and its distribution channels that are already in place. The only remaining question is whether they should lead or follow. We say lead. Thank you. So you say the test of a memorandum of understanding from three years ago is whether we've built an SMR now. 
Your claim is that the licensing process takes four to six years, that the process of constructing a domestic SMR base takes around 10 to 20. Why is that our test for whether or not the DOE's efforts are effective? I'm merely making the simple observation that a memorandum of understanding nuclear reactors does not build. And I think but that's the, congruent the with every- funding might? Sorry? I said, but the funding might? Well, the funding for these DOE loans wasn't allocated by Congress until much later, and it was announced by the administration, but not distributed until only a couple months ago. Right, so they haven't yet built one. I guess my next question is, you say that the enrichment and reprocessing components of SMRs are the reason why it's more proliferation safe, right? Does that mean the United States would enrich and reprocess for every country that it ships an SMR to? Uh, I don't think that that's a determination that we have to defend as a component of our advantage. That's so not a that's not a reason SMRs are bad. That's a Well, I'm a not I'm not trying to say it's a reason they're bad. I was just curious about that process, right? You've said that countries like China, Russia, et cetera, should not be the ones to lead this element. You've isolated that ENR is an important component of why it's safe. I'm just curious if those countries are not enriching and reprocessing, who is? Our argument is about motivation and economic incentives as well as available opportunities. All of these things contribute to norms. Where those ENR capabilities end up residing, we agree, is largely not going to be changed by one reactor being in one geographic location rather than another. But we also think that the international nonproliferation sta standards and whether they're effective are dependent on more than just counting up the kilograms of uranium in any given spot at any given time. Okay. I want to talk about your response to the microgrids component of our grid response. The, you would agree that the Seder evidence makes a claim both that microgrids are effective for deploying in war zones, are cost effective, have an impact on energy assur assurance. You would agree that they would be sufficient to resolve that concern if the DOD was investing more? If they worked exactly like Seder thinks they would, then probably. Okay, but they haven't been deployed, so we can't really know. Well, that evidence says they haven't been funded fully. The, you then assert that those are intermittent and that they wouldn't be able to back that up. Do you, I guess I'm just curious, is that just like diesel isn't proven as a fuel type? I was curious what that argument was. No, my argument's not that diesel's intermittent. It's that a backup generator on a base is it limited by the gallons of diesel present. In cross-examination, Markov clarified that you also would like the department to install renewable facilities for bases. Well, All of this, I think, sure. means that a lot of the cost problems that the military is going to run into would not be the result of SMRs. They would be the result of flawed grid policies in the past. Um, I'm not going to repeat the thanks, but... <laughs> Payton kind of already said it all. <laughs> <laughs> so we believe the downsides of the Department of Defense leading in the development of small modular nuclear reactors outweigh the potential benefits that Georgetown has discussed in this debate. Um, the primary issue is cost. Georgetown correctly points out that current military purchases from the civilian grid do put pressure on DOD budgets. But that is insignificant when compared to the price of massive SMR development in the short term. Also, given the long time frame for SMR development, the cross-ex of the first speech indicated decades, the DOD would be stuck footing the bill for both civilian electricity now in addition to new reactors at the expense of other important programs. While Cochrane may discuss concrete costs, he is by no means equating concrete with total cost. He, he also discusses costs from things like emergency management and being a first mover and the unique expenses that come with that, which Georgetown has conveniently disregarded in their last speech. Taking on the first mover role requires things like extra testing and demonstration costs, in addition to the typical safety, licensing, and waste management overhead that we've discussed previously. Even if SMRs seem economically reasonable on their own, Georgetown has failed to take into account the current economic environment where cost minimization is necessary to ensure military effectiveness due to sequestration. You should ask yourself, do we actually need a few new, possibly unnecessary reactors if they come at the expense of our troops' readiness abroad? The impact of this trade-off 
should outweigh the marginal benefits that SMRs provide in the long term. In terms of waste, they too quickly dismiss a very serious issue. The belief that SMR development could alter political gridlock seems unlikely and could be achieved by civilian development. Similarly, it is definitely too early to start discussing a waste-consuming SMR, given the time frame for a light water version maybe decades, as they say. Our point is not centered upon the need for a separate waste storage facility, but rather the necessity to avoid furthering waste buildup and absent some plan for future generations. Yes, we agree that dry cast storage is temporary and a solution, but given massive SMR expansion and commercialization as they advocate, we have to be ready for the potential problems that arise and not jump into SMR development without a plan. Additionally, they misunderstand our safety argument. It isn't about others acquiring nuclear material, but rather unknown actors creating catastrophic damage through reactor attacks and meltdowns. While attacks haven't happened in the past, the new high impact location placement could make these SMRs targets. While, and while historically the military has worked with SMRs, our argument is that there is not much recent experience in terms of what the military has done with SMRs. Their evidence and arguments discuss the 1970s naval program, and we think that this situation is different from the past. Marcus King, cited by Payton in the first speech, said, quote, regulating power plants is a function that lies beyond DOD's core mission. The military services are unlikely to have personnel with sufficient expertise. This combined with licensing hurdles, such as institutional bias towards large reactors, mean that even if the pathway is cleared, the projects could take decades to come online. Even their own Medea evidence that is cited in the 2AC concludes by saying the NRC will, quote, still need to address the number of reactor modules any one reactor operator can safely operate and the size of the emergency planning zone, issues that should create doubt in the affirmative position. With the military already recommending against taking a leading role in SMR development, it seems like this is a time where we should listen to the experts. The DOE DOD risk sharing program provides a slower but safer development route for SMRs that reduces cost and safety issues while still creating benefits down the line. I'll now address Georgetown's benefits. Um, in terms of nonproliferation, they have yet to prove the necessity of military action in this area. The status quo DOE civilian SMR program can be sufficient in achieving the same benefits regarding alternatives to ENR and international influence, especially if it's about the signal we send in terms of commercial development. Also, if SMR-based nuclear leadership can't stop states that are going to nuclearize, then their nonproliferation purpose seems limited in the face of threats like Iran, North Korea, and future adversaries. Regarding ENR, uh, Sherryman Lockman, a senior analyst in foreign policy and security studies at the Institute of Strategic and International Studies, said, quote, the overwhelming majority of countries have demonstrated little interest in establishing their own enrichment and reprocessing facilities. Optimism about the U.S. ability to dissuade these countries is also questionable, given our previous record of other priorities getting in the way. And in the cross-ex, the idea that the U.S. can enrich and reprocess for all these countries seems unfeasible. Given these points, it seems unlikely that SMR development will provide a significant nonproliferation benefit anytime soon. In terms of the grid, those concerns are also overstated. Their microgrid evidence is outdated. Are there, it's all from 2008. Ours says, quote, according to a new report from Pike Research in 2013, the total capacity of DOD microgrids will surpass 600 megawatts by 2018, a 50% increase over 2012. Microgrids are proven to work on 40 military installations today with a unique combination of inputs that prevent intermittency and combined with new backup generators, the grid is more resilient than ever and SMRs are unnecessary. Thank you. Arjun, if, if I understand you correctly, your argument about the DOE taking the lead assumes that DOD eventually purchases the reactors that are being tested. Am I correct in that? Um, we think that they could possibly do that. Yeah, our evidence indicates that if the DOE, DOD cost sharing program is oh. successful, the uh, reason they're doing that is for slower, safer, less costly development in the future, so the DOD could possibly buy. I, I understand technology. that. I'm wondering what difference that slower development makes for any of your cost arguments. So 
our evidence says that one of the main issues with costs is taking a first mover role. Um, we believe that the first mover role would create issues such as extra testing, extra demonstration that could more safely and securely be done by a gradual development by the Department of Energy. I, I guess the place where I'm confused is that your Cochrane evidence, we both agree, makes arguments about concrete scaling and distribution of emergency response units. I don't understand how the Department of Energy program causing slower development later changes that cost structure. You're right. There are still going to be costs. Our argument is the degree of cost would be mitigated by not taking a first mover role. Okie doke. Your Cunningham evidence, the, the card that says there's a waste problem with SMRs, mm -hmm. says that the Blue Ribbon Commission's recommendations are the best way forward on this issue. Are there any indications that any of their recommendations are moving forward on the Hill? Um, I mean, probably not, based on what's happening on the Hill. But our, 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 our point is br more simple than just, do we need to do that specific recommendation? It's rather, we should have a plan before a massive expansion of SMRs. It's nope. not, we're not sure exactly what the right recommendation is or if the Hill or people on the Hill will accept the blue ribbon. But it's a question of, should we just start continuing to pile up waste in a temporary solution that we're not sure will last 15, 20 years down the line? That, that makes some sense. So you're emphasizing the meltdowns component of the Nexon evidence now rather than the terrorism component, if I understood you correctly. I'm wondering if you can give me an example of a deleterious impact to anyone that resulted from a meltdown in the US. There might not have been a meltdown in the U.S. that has had a large impact. Our point is a broad expansion and a rushed expansion, possibly, through the DOD can have problems in terms of safety. Okay. Um, your AMON evidence, the microgrids report from yep. Pike Research, mm -hmm. uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but he's the individual in charge of that program, right? Um, I would have to look up, but I, maybe. That was in the first speech, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My, my only concern is that it seems like he's announcing the microgrids program to the press. Is there a count of the number of bases on which this has been successfully deployed Yeah, that deployed evidence talks tested? about 40 bases in the U.S. having it successfully deployed. All right, well, thank you guys. That's the end of the first part of the debate. I'll turn it over to our expert judges for some questions for the debaters, and then we'll turn it over to you all. So I'm gonna start with uh, Scott, maybe. Be sure to use the microphones. Okay, sure. <clears throat> I just wanna say real quick that Scott's notes over here are absolutely amazing in terms of just how he's been following your debates. Yeah, you, you, you need to like fall, give this to the, to the class afterwards. Well. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you that for the most of the people that are in the audience have any debate experience, they're going to recognize this note taking okay. and know it for the fraud that it is. But, th but thanks, Tom. <laughs> okay. Uh, a question uh, for both the affirmative and for the negative. Uh, it seems to me that uh, on the question of who's the better first mover, the, the DOE uh, commercialization program or uh, DOD as a first mover uh, in this specific case, the, uh, the, the evidence that comes uh, that, that suggests the DOD has a unique talent or skill at first mover comes from the DOD in the first speech. And the evidence that suggests the DOE is better comes from the DOE. Um, I can, being a, a Washington creature myself, I can certainly understand, particularly I believe, as one of you said, in times of sequestration and, and uh, tight budgets, why people are fond of their own programs. Is there any evidence that suggests, and this is on the not on SMRs as a general proposition, but on the narrow question of who should be the first mover, that doesn't come from the DOD, or in the case of the DOE, that doesn't come from the DOE. Have we heard any in this debate? Uh, so there are sort of two separate questions that I heard. Mm -hmm. One is whether uh, this evidence exists, and the second is whether you've heard it in this debate. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess I'll respond to the first for sort of general knowledge purposes that yes, there are people at the National War College uh, as well as several independent reports that have substantiated both the DOD first mover and the DOE first mover arguments. As well, far as- Let me interrupt you. Uh, the National War College, is that, can anybody apply to that? Is that a, they have like a football team or something? <laughs> Okay, well, I'm assuming that's part of the same 
defense operation. As far as independent studies suggesting the DOE is the better, DOD is the better first mover, are they so independent that they were funded independently, or might these be questions that the DOD themselves asked? I would leave that question to the negative. Okay. <laughs> To, if one and, thing, if I could chime in, though, in sort of a large part of the literature written about DOD first mover on SMR, is that the DOD is an effective first mover. So you have multiple right. instances in the last few decades of DOD adopting technology and then disseminating it to the public space. R really? So can you name another? Just The, to, the uh, internet is probably the biggest okay, example. Okay, very good. Very good. Um, obviously, there's like medical advances. Penicillin is uh, one that people know about. Yeah, semiconductors. I think the concern in the literature is more broadly, so most of the evidence I've seen at least talks about the DOD in the context of SMRs, but in terms of the first mover role of the DOD, it becomes a debate about whether or not locking in a particular type, picking a winner is the better approach or letting it develop sort of more competitively without guaranteeing the market of the DOD. And so. And the, and the DOE is better at that. Well, so the so that's the back and forth. Is I, I have seen less evidence that compares the DOD as a first mover versus the DOE. I have seen evidence about the DOD as a first mover creating lock-in that's worse for the market. Ha, have or you, has literature disclosed anything about the occasional, the odd error the DOE might make as a first mover? The odd error? Yeah, the fun, funding of an energy project that didn't work out so well. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I think there have been some Might have been some talk. <laughs> it's heard tell of it. Let me see what these other learned gentlemen say. Please, Palm. Palm. I, I'll just follow on, on Scott's question um, because it seems that one of the arguments is that DOE should be the first mover and not DOD, and, and yet one of the um, supporting evidence is in times of sequestration, we shouldn't be putting this type of onus on DOD, but it all comes from the same checkbook, um, whether it's at the Department of Energy or whether it's at the Department of Defense. So I guess my question is why do you care whether it's coming out of DOE or DOD if, if it's a concern about spending? So I would say part of our contention for that is whether or not SMR development will occur. The DOD funding and sort of the affirmative that they've presented would procure those SMRs for bases across the United States. The idea behind the DOE current funding is that they're attempting to sort of kickstart an industry that then develops them, which I think will be a less, less of a financial investment than buying a bunch of the SMRs for all of the different bases, if that makes any sense. DOE is doing, uh, under an MOU with DOD, is trying to develop a program that would commercialize uh, SMRs for? So the memorandum of understanding is about the way the interaction happens. The actual budget allocations that um, they've talked about is for giving money to those, to companies that have designed them. But the who's, the, who's the target audience in terms of who would buy these SMRs, whether uh, it's developed th um, from this at DOE program? Those, I think, are initially commercial development of SMRs. Okay. From my understanding. <laughs> Pull your money. Uh, let's talk about the, the concern that SMRs represent a military target right, or an additional target. Uh, so right now, we've got roughly 100 small reactors that, that are operated by the Navy. I think it's on roughly 85 ships. Those ships aren't always out at sea, right? Uh, they're at port somewhere. So you have uh, already, I'm assuming those military bases are already potential targets with small reactors on ships, with the public that's accustomed to having those nuclear reactors that they can see on those ships. Well, maybe they can't see the reactors, but they can see the ships. And so therefore, the question is, if, if we're looking at deployment on, let's say, those military bases where people are already accustomed to having them present, does that alleviate some of your concerns about them adding on to the sort of the military target? I think it may, but our bigger concern, I think, is the broad expansion in terms of every base or many in terms of isolating them from the grid. In terms of doing that and to resolve some of Georgetown's concerns, it seems like it would be a much larger expansion than the current docking of Navy ships um, with military bases. And our argument also comes from the expertise side. It is true that there's a, a nuclear Navy program. We don't dispute that. But our, qu our question is, with a massive expansion, is there the DOD workforce and expertise still available 
net, that can deal with that expansion and su successfully regulate it. Um, that raises another Thank you. That raises another question. I, I haven't seen any literature that suggests that we should drop an SMR on every single military base that we have, okay? I think that for, for, for one reason is because SMRs produce a lot more electricity than, say, most bases take, right? And so I think that when you're looking at military bases themselves, you have to ask two questions. First, is there a demand for the electricity, right? And if there's, and the SMR produces more electricity than the demand, then the question is, well, what are you doing, what are you gonna do with that extra, extra electricity? The second piece is, what basis, what basis do we absolutely have to have separate from the grid because we need that counter-strike capability, okay? So, so I think that, um, and I've lost my thought actually. Well, can, I, can, I, can I ask a, I wanted to ask a question based on what Dave just said. Let's say, let's say, because this is debate, and debate has a, a little power we like to call fiat. So if they want to put a, a, a small, modular reactor on every base, well, all they have to do is wave their magic wand and the money gets printed up and off they go. Uh, let's assume for a moment that you did put an SMR on a base where it generated more electricity than the base required. Now, what would normally happen in a situation like that is you would sell the excess electricity back onto the grid, which would then make money. Uh, ha does the literature disclose anything about potentially selling electricity back to the grid? and raising money that could actually begin to pay for maybe successive generations of either innovation or new deployment? Uh, the, the King report that the negative has introduced pieces of to the debate right. is sort of the, the most authoritative uh, internal department opinion on this issue. And there's a whole subsection that raises that possibility and presents it as a, a potentially attractive byproduct of this proposal. Um, it's not one that we introduced in this debate, uh, you know, largely because of, of time constraints, but it, hypothetically the sale of pow excess power would be, you know, net profitable. My God, man, they're arguing spending. <laughs> Might that not have been a place for you to introduce it? I hate to critique you, <laughs> but, you know. I think it also raises the interesting question of ownership. So an added component of a lot of that literature is about whether or not that SMR is purchased and run by the military on the base, or whether or not private utility companies yes. locate close by, guarantee that the military base has power, and sell to the civilian grid, which is obviously a layer that we didn't They talk don't about. even have to locate close by. It is possible for them to own and operate. In fact, real world just for a moment, probably <laughs> in many cases there would be a contract to a civilian company that would run, at least I hope, they wouldn't be taking <laughs> Uh, grunts fresh off out of uh, Paris Island and having them operate a nuclear power plant no matter how small. So there probably would be licensed professionals that would be running the plant. Right, percent. right. Yeah. yeah, it's more likely that you have Un a... Unlike the nuclear Navy where... Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, no, it's, it's more likely that you have a public-private partnership where a utility operates the SMR, for example, right? And you have a purchase power agreement associated with all that. Yeah. Well, the, uh, most of the civilian fleet is run by former nuclear navy operators right so yes yeah, and so they they do have the the expertise no one else and, is training and, and just to kind of follow on one of D david's point i would i uh, will say that dod has um interest beyond costs in terms of when how they evaluate technologies and and deploying them and one being you know readiness and preparedness and so whether or not how much it costs is irrelevant if it's we need this for Counter-Strike possibilities. Um, for the Andrews, I have a question about the, um, 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 you, in your in initial um, speech, you talked about DOD having this proven track record and, 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 um, and DOE not, uh, and, and I would just um, ask the question about DOD's proven track record with the nuclear weapons complex and, and specifically like the Hanford site, which currently has a number of nuclear waste um, tanks that are buried but are now leaking and they're trying to figure out where to send them and who to manage it and how to, how to deal with it because of the way that the DOD has managed the nuclear weapons complex was blow it up now, we'll clean it up later. And, um, and, and trying to figure out, is that the proven track record that we really want from an environmental management perspective? 
that that's a great question. Um, I think it is possible to draw a separation between some of the mistakes of the past and what we're advocating. And I think there are sort of two answers to your question that sort of address it head on. First is um, SMRs by design are built in a way that they can store their own waste, that they largely are self-contained. Plus, in terms of civilian nuclear waste, even if that weren't the case, there's dry cask storage, on-site storage, uh, and those technologies have been proven. So the DOD wouldn't take its Hanford approach, or we hope and think it wouldn't take its Hanford approach, build them into SMRs that already have more effective means of dealing with waste. Um, and second, I think the sort of converse to that is, you know, the, the DOE uh, at the same time hasn't shown its expertise in terms of being able to engage the market. So even with those downsides, we still think if SMRs are desirable uh, and if they can eventually generate either political momentum or a technical solution to waste, that only the DOD could carry through with its signal to the market. Do we know how expensive microgrids are to deploy? Like on a per base basis? I, I don't think our evidence specifically speaks to that. Um, truthfully, the evidence just says that there are 40 places that it's being demonstrated now with uh -huh. many more projects to come. Um, so I'm assuming it's already part of the budget for what the DOD is planning, and that's what our evidence that discusses them acting on the Defense Science Board, like the 2008 review, and ramping up the backup generators as well as microgrids discusses. So, But if I'm understanding what a microgrid is, it means like, um, you know, a, a, a little, a, your own little piece of the grid that's, uh, that's for a particular uh, plant, which, which to me speaks to the virtues of what's called distributed generation, exactly that, uh, that we ought to have a diesel generator, uh, a windmill, God forbid, or, uh, <laughs> you know, natural gas or, or something uh, that provides uh, your own little piece of the grid. But doesn't that admit, uh, you have, d at least it admits the premise that the deployment of the SMR, which is a, it, in itself its own little piece of the grid, also would have that salutary effect on, on uh, the stability of the grid. Is that, I mean, do you do agree with that? I mean, it is undeniable that, the, that yeah. deploying SMRs would isolate bases from the civilian grid and okay. provide that option. Okay. Because I mean, an advanced it's microgrid, sent, it's the outcome, and it, what's right. powering it is, is irrelevant, yeah. right? It's whether it's a windmill could be diesel, or, could be diesel an SMR. or an SMR. Right. It's, it's, the, it's all trying to provide the, the island aspect of, of the, um, the complex. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but having said that, you know, one of the questions, one of the points that was made about advanced microgrids is that it's, quote, unproven technology. Um, which obviously, we, or, or no, not unproven technology, it's just been unproven. Um, but I, I guess one could say the same thing about an SMR. Um, and, Only and, more so. Right. right. I would say the SMR is kind of the hydrogen car of the nuclear um, industry, right? It's always 10 years away, um, <laughs> n n no matter what year it is. Um, um, and advanced microgrids, really the problem with deploying those, whether whatever it is that's um, that's um, powering it, it's more of a contracting problem, right? P power purchase agreements is kind of more of an issue rather than deciding how you're going to power it, um, or is it uh, and, and what what your generation problem uh, issues are? <laughs> I I mean I think for us we would from our perspective. Like, truthfully, I would say that it's more of a power generation issue in terms of the sources being put together in a way that has backups and aren't intermittent. But the advancements in microgrids with developments like smart microgrids, the Spiders Project, things like that have worked on the technological side. So that does bring up the point of how is the best way to develop them. And our, our evidence, at least in, on our side of this debate, says that the DOD is steadfastly working towards that solution in terms of microgrids and is on a positive track in terms of having the technology and knowing kind of the right places to use solar on which basis versus wind as the backup and, and making sure it's uh, not a top-down approach but rather kind of a case-by-case -case for different bases. You know, it, it strikes me we never offered our thanks 
<laughs> so, as the guy in the middle, I want to make sure that thanks meet thanks. And I also want to formally accept the thanks <laughs> that was offered. So thank you for your thanks. All right, guys. Well, to continue the tradition of thanks, thanks for the questions. Uh, I think we're going to move on to the audience Q&A portion of the session. We've got Adrian and someone whose name I embarrassingly don't know, who both have microphones. So uh, if you could just raise your hand, I'll call on you. Um, someone will bring you a microphone. Just identify yourself, give your name and your affiliation, and then we'll go from there. So start right here. Thank you. Uh, S Stephen Dolly, uh, I'm a reporter covering nuclear energy for Platts and Fair Disclosure, a former uh, college debate contemporary of Mr. Siegel back in the late Pleistocene era. Uh, and having survived my fair share of, of non-proliferation debates both in Washington and in academia, I'm hoping to unpack a little bit what the scenario is for how an invigorated U.S. SMR domestic base would enhance U.S. influence over nonproliferation. As you all know, and as most people in the room know, there's just a huge number of ways in which the literature discusses how the U a U.S. domestic nuclear industry might positively or negatively influence the risk of nuclear weapons proliferation. It seems like in this debate what you're primarily saying is that if there were a strong U.S. Uh, SMR sector, any nation that ju just uh, you know turns up its nose at an offer of a U.S. F SMR would flag itself for the international community uh, as a potential proliferant. Uh, it seems like the first question there is: is doesn't that necessarily assume, therefore, that the U.S. would be supplying the fuel and perhaps uh, reprocessing services for the SMRs? And if that were the case. Why would a potential proliferant nation want to enter into an agreement to buy an SMR from us as opposed to Russia, China, or these other countries? Um, and, 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 and secondly, uh, uh, there was a second aspect to that uh, in terms of the influence. Uh, you know, how much, you know, how much influence does the uh, uh, the enrichment and reprocessing? aspect of that have in a, in a decision as to who who you would want to buy your nuclear power plant from okay so um there are, there are primarily two routes to effective non-proliferation uh impacts to smrs that are discussed in the literature the first is related to the reactor itself and there's a phrase used called cradle to grave um, effectiveness, where as a self-contained unit that is operated and monitored by the private com uh, company that developed the reactor, it would be abundantly clear if the materials or the waste that resulted or even the processes were, were captured and taken from that reactor. Now, the, the second component of the question, if I understand you correctly, is why, does, why is the U.S. tied to any of that? Why isn't that just a function of the reactor, right? And the, the second component is largely a norms-based argument, right? So the U.S. has different diplomatic priorities, we think, than other countries who would offer those reactors. So while the influence component of a strong nuclear domestic industry might not be intrinsically tied to the physical reactor, the two in conjunction are uniquely beneficial. And just to follow up real quickly, not, not to get too wonky, but as you may know, the, 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 the SMR designs that are nearest to commercial fruition are not cradle to grave. Those are subsequent designs down the line from, I don't remember what they're called now, they used to be called Hyperion and people like that, and maybe even some of the generation four designs you talk about, the, the LWR SMRs that are being considered in the US right now are not cradle to grave and would need to be refueled and something would need to be done with their spent fuel, so there is a consideration there. Totally agree. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Uh, yeah. right there. So I have two questions. My name is Larry Minert. I'm the head of the Mineral Resources Program for the United States Geological Survey. The listed question for debate is the United States should commit to revitalizing its nuclear power industry. Nowhere in here to say anything about small modular nuclear reactors. So my first question is, what the heck are we focusing on that 
only one small piece of the nuclear industry, and why are you saying that that is the only possible way forward? Number two, assuming we are going to go forward in that direction, if we do simple mathematics, if we have small reactors that are, let's say, for the sake of argument, one-tenth the size of a regular reactor, that means for the same capacity we need ten of those for every one sort of normal size plant, which means that we now have ten exposures for potential disasters like happened in Japan, where an apparently unforeseen earthquake tsunami caused a huge disaster. So it seemed like the calculus of having ten times more exposure to plants gives us a risk that would not be there with larger plants. Uh, great question. So to answer the first part of sort of why SMRs versus the, the broader industry, um, you know, our, our contention is that SMRs are the way forward for the industry. So we have a class of LWRs that are outdated, that are falling behind technologically to other countries that are developing either pushing for generation four, SMRs, new LWR designs that are safer, that are cheaper, um, and they're being subsidized by those governments. And we think that sort of relying on existing technology can't get the job done. It can't get the job done for the DOD. It doesn't have the potential to be cradle to the grave at some point in the future, which we think is important for nonproliferation. And so SMRs, plus we think that SMRs are sort of inherently safer because they're smaller, because they have passive safety. Um, and so they represent a move that we think ameliorates most of the, the problems with nuclear power as it exists now. And we do think that there's a potential for a robust industry to be built around them. Um, to answer the second part of your question, I think a lot of the SMR studies that we've read throughout the course of this year contest the characterization of the 10 times as much risk. Um, and one thing we haven't talked about yet, uh, but is in this report by Cassidy's from the World Bank that we read, is that when you, the, the way SMRs would be rolled out, assuming there were a vibrant industry, was that you would build an SMR cluster. So you would have a single containment unit, uh, a single waste repository, et cetera, a single set of you know, security measures, a single uh, external wall, et cetera. And then you would build in units within that. So that's a way to solve the scale problem without having to, uh, you know, you don't have like an SMR here, an SMR here, an SMR here. They're sort of clamped together with one central control system for safety. Um, the other thing is, you know, sort of this passive safety argument that we've been discussing a lot is, you know, the Fukushima meltdown that you referred to, you know, a more traditional large reactor design uh, and an SMR is less prone to those sort of shocks. It's much faster cooling off and the self-containment aspects we think reduce the risk of that being catastrophic in the U.S. Uh, for those of you who didn't debate in the audience, I also just want to take judge's prerogative to add one more thing to the answer to question one. It probably does sound a little tinny um, because, you know, we have a, a major deployment of nukes right now in light water reactors and traditional, and, and, uh, and there are other recommendations for addressing the, the current fleet. Uh, the reason I'm taking the judge's prerogative for a moment is because in debate we have a convention of proof by example. Typically what will happen is uh, a resolution, which is being debated, or a topic, is broad in nature to encourage as much cross-fertilization and thinking and, and innovation within, within the particular year. So by convention, we allow the teams, particularly the affirmative team, who, who specifies what will be debated in the particular round, to debate an example of the resolution. Even though, for formal logic reasons, a single example doesn't prove a larger resolution, we kind of, with a wink and a nod, allow that as a convention in competitive debate. And you're seeing that, I think, most excellently, is that a word, uh, on display here, where there's a deep dive on a particular example rather than trying to grapple with the entire resolution. So that's kind of what's going on. I think we've got time for one final question. Yeah. Um, my name is Hyung Jung, and I used to train in the Korean uh, APC company, which is fifth exporter of the nuclear power plant. And my question is: Do we the uh, do the U.S. have the enough resources for construction nuclear power plants such as SMR? Because if you do not have any resources, then you have to import from the other country. Then it will be the cost will be higher, and it will be skyrocket. Yeah, thank you. Um, just to clarify, uh, uranium resources or manufacturing capacity or both? Uh, 
are we talking about like uranium or or manufacturing capacity? Um, I mean, I think we're fortunate uh, to to have someone from the geologic survey here, but uh, uh, their most recent reports indicate that there's in excess of 100 to 150 years of uranium capacity in the domestic uh, United States that's readily available for mining, even under their higher of three scenario planning trajectories for nuclear expansion in the future. Um, I don't have a citation for that right in front of me, um, but I'm fairly confident in a similar appraisal to that. I don't want to specify a statistic. All right, well, thank you guys. and going to begin the last component of our debate where each team will have an opportunity to advance their final concluding remarks. So I'll turn it back over to Andrew Markoff for a second time. Okay, so to conclude this debate, I think we have to ask ourselves one sort of broad question. Negative is presented arguments about how much it would cost to build SMRs, maybe a small risk that there would be more waste, a, we think very marginal risk that there would be an accident or some sort of safety malfunction. Setting that aside for a second, we've made the argument that DOD's assets are vulnerable to blackouts. And we're talking about not just sort of some assets, some least important ones, basically all of them run out of the United States. We're talking about command and control of US military forces that span the globe the ability to control United States nuclear weapons, the ability to con create points of contact and intelligence. These are critical capabilities. And our argument isn't that they'll all collapse at once. It's not a doomsday scenario. But if O3 demonstrates anything, it's that a squirrel running into a power line or a cyber attack, which our evidence says the attempts at cyber probing are increasing rapidly, could bring down a large majority of the system. Now they say the cost might be too high for the DOD. But ask yourself, how could the cost be higher than a base going off the grid for an extended period of time? Plus, global nuclear power, I think we all agree, is being built out now. But there aren't safety precautions. Only a new US domestic industry builds in safety precautions. It prevents blackouts in the future. It prevents meltdowns in the future. It creates a new series of modular reactors suitable for small country electric grids that can be exported to improve global safety. So if safety and waste are your concerns, US leadership is better than the leadership of a different country. The question is follow or lead. To talk about the grid, the Sater piece of evidence that our thread in the 2AC says that the DOD consistently overstates their case. And I think we've heard a lot about this. DOD evidence, people who write for the DOD, such as Amon, who they read, say the microgrids are working fine now. Our evidence says they're not being built out fast enough and that SMRs provide the only sufficient baseload power generation for a base. Consider everything that has to be done on a base. We're talking about global intelligence, nuclear weapons, the ability to keep command and control over the globe. Now think about what other microgrids run on. We know renewables are intermittent. The sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow. We know fossil fuels are being regulated out of existence and we know diesel isn't really enough. Small operations, perhaps, but for the entire US military, probably not. They raise questions of cost. Microgrid spending is happening now. The DOD and DOE are spending tons of money, public money, in spite of sequestration to either build out SMRs, to procure biofuels for the military. The question is, what's the most effective path forward? We don't think there's a huge impact to more spending because the DOE is trying, but it's a question of scale as well as the Cassidy's World Bank report that says that SMRs get cheaper as they're built out. So even if it's a long-term commitment, those costs fall as standardization results in factory construction. They say we've conveniently disregarded other costs. They've disregarded our economies of multiples argument, the one from Cassidy's that I explained already. They say sequestration means that there's a precarious spot for the military, and we agree. But what is more precarious than a grid blackout that brings down military operations? On the question of waste, waste, excuse me, you should ask yourself, do you think that the United States is incapable of coming to either a political or technological solution for waste? We think no, but the political sclerosis on the issue 
is largely the result of there not being a strong domestic industry. Supply meets demand, something like Yucca Mountain, more efficient dry cask storage, even Generation 4 solutions would be built. And it's ridiculous to assert that waste is a short-term problem. Multiple decades, even if it requires multiple decades, a solution can be found. On questions of safety, I think the negative has largely retreated from their ridiculous claim that a US military base would be attacked with an SMR on it. We know that that's almost impossible. The question of whether an SMR would melt down, we would wager first that we have 104 LWRs or light water reactors now. So that's not something that we would increase the risk of a ton, but also that SMRs are safer. They have passive safety systems. They're more earthquake resistant. Another Fukushima is more unlikely if we make our technology better. They make arguments about licensing. The Medea piece of evidence from Medea that Arsh read, which is a study about NRC licensing in the SMR context, says that they need to assure that they're safe, sure. But it's also a question of, uh, will it be more difficult to license SMRs? And that evidence is quite good at saying the safety concerns are even smaller, so the licensing process should be faster. They say the DOE can be a first mover. They've only allocated 500 million, which isn't even really enough to create a successful demonstration. And if that, not enough to plug into the grid. Look, SMRs will be built in some countries. Nuclear power will be built everywhere. The question is, does the US stand behind as its grid gets more brittle and more vulnerable, and as other countries dictate proliferation norms, or does it take the lead? The DOD is the only capable branch of the government that can take the lead in this regard, and so there's simply no alternative. Thank you. I will begin by saying that as a framing point, we are college students. The DOD was asked to evaluate its grid vulnerabilities in 2008, determined that it was vulnerable, and has taken action to move forward and address those issues. The DOD was asked to evaluate the use of nuclear on its bases domestically in 2010, and responded by saying it did not want to be the first mover on nuclear development, that instead it thought the DOE and further investments were necessary because of issues like first-of-a-kind costs. Yes, funding something is an important component. Yes, spending is occurring now for microgrids. But funding an investment in technology that uses status quo energy efforts to upgrade our systems is very different than the DOD being the first mover on a major new initiative on developing a widespread SMR deployment and procuring those for what they have described as almost every base in the United States due to vulnerabilities. That massive increase in funding will not, I don't think, involve a lot of new funding from Congress, if anything is indicated by the past few months, but instead will involve trade-offs between other major missions. Those choices are already being forced on the DOD by cuts from sequestration, forcing millions of dollars of investment in SMRs in the status quo is a dangerous choice to make if it is true that our DOD infrastructure is so dangerous they are taking action to resolve it. The second component of this is waste and safety. We can cross our fingers and hope that Congress overcomes the gridlock on waste, but why should we wait and do that after it has become an even more dramatic problem? Waste will expand. If the military uses an SMR on every base in the United States, the amount of waste developed massively expands. Yes, we have some components that are short-term fixes, but asking any experts, a lot of those are not guaranteed for a particularly long period of time, and that only assumes status quo amounts of waste. Yes, safety of bases is something that we would like to take for granted, but there are unknown reasons why meltdowns could possibly occur. SMRs might have advanced safety features, but the heightened risk of a meltdown occurring on a base, whether that's an intentional attack or an accidental meltdown that no one could have predicted, those costs are far higher and not worth the risk, particularly when status quo efforts are being deployed that are effective. In regards to their advance of offense, they've made two claims, proliferation and grid safety. The proliferation component I find a stretch of the imagination. Yes, US leadership in the context of norms is important in affecting the way that countries make decisions, 
But whether or not we own and produce SMRs has very little influence on other countries' motivations for proliferating in a dangerous manner. I'm unclear what country will decide not to proliferate in a dangerous way because the United States has built a new type of nuclear reactor. If it's a question of the safety features that are included in an SMR, they have yet to address who does the enrichment, who does the reprocessing. The current SMR models are not cradle to grave. They are nuclear material being spread internationally. And if it's only a model question, then why are the 15 other countries that are developing SMRs not sufficient? The continued hubris of asserting that the United States is the only one capable of establishing safety standards is laughable and unfounded in the evidence that their evidence are, or the evidence that they've cited. The second component of this is the grid. They have cited nothing after the 2008 report that says that the grid for the military is still vulnerable. The idea that every base in the United States is shut down, which is his explanation for this catastrophic impact, the US military ceases to exist, is highly improbable. At best, small scale blackouts in certain regions cut off one base. Maybe. We haven't seen it for decades. We haven't seen the consequences of it for decades. What we have seen is an expansion since 2008 of microgrids. The investment in things like diesel, renewables, et cetera, are all resolutions to the problem that they have isolated. It's unclear to me why their evidence, which concludes that microgrids are sufficiently effective, should be preferred. Maybe it's true that the DOD needs to invest further in microgrids. That might be an alternate proposal that resolves the component of SMRs. But it is certainly not true that SMRs are the only solution to the DOD's current vulnerabilities. And given the massive costs and dangers associated with those, they are certainly not the solution we should endorse. All right, well, uh, thank you guys. Um, it occurs to me to mention that, you know, it's exam period for all of these debaters, so I do really appreciate that they're willing to put in the time to come up with these arguments and stuff, and I think that your applause is well deserved. So we're going to turn it back over to the judges for another few minutes of uh, comments about the debate. Um, well, first of all, I want I, I legitimately, and without tongue planted firmly in cheek, I want to thank you guys for presenting an example of what college debate can really be. Uh, this was uh, analytical. It, it, uh, it showed a, a tremendous familiarity with the underlying literature. And when you weren't grounding your arguments in the underlying literature, you made it up with a plum. <laughs> and, uh, and that, too, prepares you for a life and career here in Washington, DC. <laughs> so no, in all seriousness, this was just marvelous. And it's really what I like to see. And it, it, you know, for those of you who don't know, I, I spent some time as a debate coach, and I also spent some time as a as a, an administrator to the national tournament. And um, I just, uh, you know, I wish every college administrator in the country who has faces their own sequestration battle about what extracurricular activities to fund could see this when they think about what kind of a role debate plays in the marketplace of ideas in their own academic community, because it'd be a, a great situation. Okay, enough of the easy stuff. Um, I would have, frankly, from the negative, would have liked to have seen more discussion about what to do and, and what the nature is and what the alternatives are to SMRs, what to do with the existing nuclear fleet. Now, you don't, as I, as I noted a moment ago, no one has an obligation to defend light water reactors under the terms of debate convention here. However, as a negative, uh, you begin in the microgrids debate to discuss, well, SMR seems like a very expensive way to address the particular issues at play here. So for example, um, more discussion of, of what a, micro, a microgrid uh, constitutes, more of a comparison of distributed generation to centralized generation. We do have this existing fleet of large, expensive nuclear power plants that have some of the same benefits the affirmative is talking about. It would have been nice to hear about what other innovations, aside from making a lot of little nuclear plants, there might be. It may be that SMRs is the best, but there are, are, are certainly uh, any, any true policy analysis of SMRs would have to begin with what are we giving up to move in that direction. I like the strategy employed 
uh, by both the negative and the affirmative on on you know on the issues as debated. I will say one thing. Um, the notion is, if I understand it correctly, we don't actually even have to build an SMR in order to get the proliferation advantage. All we have to do is say we're going to build an SMR and signal to the, to the marketplace and everyone on God's green earth that there will be a next generation of SMRs. Even the DOE can do that, right? So if it's true that mere signaling is enough to achieve the proliferation advantage, it, as a tactical matter, you don't have to win that the DOE is capable of actually cutting a check and actually building something. You just have to win that they're capable of issuing a press release, which those of us who work in Washington know they are very capable of doing, right? So just a, a little bit there. Uh, I know you're caging on the location of reprocessing, but it almost sounds to the audience and to, to me as a judge like there's a whole second debate going on about reprocessing that we're not getting to hear. Uh, and it, it, it does seem to me to be quite critical, particularly when you're placing the SMR in the context of reprocessing. So either have that debate or figure out a better way to not have that debate. It's my advice as a, as a coach. Um, last item is um, on the waste issue for me. We make an assumption that the waste will always be kept on site and stored in you know, secure casks, which is, which is, of course, what conventional nuclear power plants are, are forced to do or forced to think about. We don't know, and given the nature of this topic, it might not be topical for you to specify, but we don't know exactly what decisions the Department of Defense will make in terms of security. They are also very good at moving things around in the Department of Defense. In fact, probably most of what DOD does is engage in logistics. They may well decide to, uh, to, to move waste around, particularly if there's a massive deployment on their bases. What are the implications? One, it might force the construction of Yucca Mountain. It might force the construction of some other <laughs> military issue. Number two, uh, they don't have a particularly good track record as far as waste storage is concerned at centralized locations, CEG Lawler's discussion of Hanford, right? Uh, or number three, they might uh, provide greater targets, even though they're better at moving things around than the civilian industry would be potentially to moving things to Yucca. There's a whole other debate there. Uh, that's the substructure of the uh, waste debate seems to be missing here because of time. I mean, it's not missing because you didn't think any of these things. But I think it's worth bringing, flat, ferreting out some of those issues for folks that are listening. And that's more than enough. Dave, Tom. Go ahead, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll parrot Scott's statement just about uh, just how invigorating a, a conversation this was, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to kind of hear as well as develop your uh, your your arguments. And not being a debater, uh, I appreciate you kind of explaining kind of because I had the same question: Why aren't we talking about? Why were you talking about? Why not uh, LWR? Because and 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 with my time on the Hill and and um, and all the issues with the civilian nuclear fleet. The nuclear debate has pretty much been a very binary debate. It's a yes or no question. It's so you're you're debating, should we do nuclear or should we not? And and um, and this was more of a discussion. It, it was both of y'all were essentially saying yes, um, and it was a question of who should be doing it. Um, and I would have enjoyed more of a conversation of why, um, and and why should DOD do doing it or why should DOE? Why should and we kind of talked about or why should we do it at all? Um, as as a, a conversation, and um, and for uh, the the negative, you, you, I thought that the discussion about the advanced microgrids was kind of the that was the way to go, right? That that we're that you've got all these um, these programs in place for DOE to set up these islands, um, and and even just a conversation, an explanation of how much it would cost to deploy wind with backup battery power and maybe even with the backup diesel if you want to have, you know, redundancies. Um, compare that to the cost of a theoretical SMR. Um, and, and you probably would win that. Um, you know, very, very often, renewables have a hard time discussing, battling the battle of, uh, of costs, but nuclear makes that pretty easy to, to fight that right now. Um, and um, the... Both of you all kind of enjoyed the, the tyranny of the hypothetical um, when you're going and going after the other, the, the what if blackouts. And so we have to have the, this, these, this thing to, to, um, to battle against some sort of you know, huge grid failure or the what if meltdowns. Um, what if we have all these uh, um, um, plants and they all melt down? Um, and you know, we can always have plenty of hypothetical what ifs. Um, unfortunately, you know, Fukushima gave us a, you know, Japan had a great safety record in, in, in its nuclear fleet until it didn't. 
Um, and so that's always something that you uh, uh, have to deal with. Um, <laughs> um, on, on waste, you know, one of the things, uh, again, y'all brought up as uh, short-term fixes. Um, and, you know, dry cast storage is a 100-year fix. Um, and, can, and when you talk, contemplate the, the technology advances that we've had in the past 100 years, other than the fact that we still, you know, dig mud out of the ground and burn it. Um, but uh, and, and, and plenty of other industries, there's been plenty. There's been a lot of, of advancement, and one would hope that maybe you know, um, um, uh, within a hundred years, we could maybe even find something to do with with our nuclear waste. Um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, but again, I, I, I think you guys were, were, were fantastic and very impressive. Thanks. Yeah, you guys uh, did a wonderful job, and uh, I certainly concur with my colleagues' uh, remarks. To, to, to follow up on a point that, that Tom made, uh, yeah, people, both of you, both sides were talking about first mover or not for DOD or DOE. The question is, why do we need a first mover, right? Uh, f someone has to be a first mover in, in advancing a new technology or new platform. And, you know, the question is, why should it be DOD? Well, first of all, I think that uh, if you look at if you look at the domestic energy situation, right, there are a number of utilities that are certainly interested in SMR deployment, and the reason why they're interested in SMR deployment is because there's a lot of regulatory uncertainty uh, regarding EPA emissions. I mean, EPA regulations regarding greenhouse gases and other pollutants. Uh, this is something that my colleagues know all too well. Uh, the, the issue is if, if you're a utility, right, and you, and you think that you're going to get hit by uh, a future EPA regulation that forces you to shut down one or two coal plants in a certain part of, the, part of your service area, then the question is what do you replace it with, right? And when you've got the president suggesting that the United States needs to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by 80 percent by 2050, what does that mean, right? Assuming that the climate agenda progresses, assuming that EPA continues to tighten the standards, right? Natural gas will fall off of that at some point. And if you're a utility, if you're an investor, these projects are going to last 40, 50, 60 years, right? So you have to you have to be able to sort of deploy. You have to deploy uh, a generation source that you anticipate are going to meet those future standards, right? So given all the regulatory uncertainty, given the cost of, of the SMRs, I think, I think that both sides did a good job talking about the cost. Uh, you, it, it, it's necessary for someone to be the first mover. DOD is in a good situation. You can make a solid national security argument as to why we need to protect at least a certain military bases from cyber disruption. Etc. Uh, that can provide an order book that sends a signal to the market that will then pour in investment that will drive down cost of deployment. But great job. Yeah, thank you all for coming. Uh, I don't know that we have any more formal programming, but I'd certainly encourage these conversations to continue as you eat what's left of the food and drink what remains of the drink. So thank you all for coming. <laughs>